in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Do please have a seat. I have great pleasure in announcing something this morning. It is this. I have had a vision, brothers and sisters. The Lord, oh God Almighty, has spoken to me and said to me, Pastor, he has said, for that is what he calls me. Pastor, he says, I have good news for you. I am going to shower your congregation with abundant blessings. Can I get a praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Amen. I'm going to make your church full of millionaires. Whoa. Praise the Lord. Hey, praise the Lord. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, you're going to all become so wealthy, so full of miracles, signs and wonders that the whole community of heaven will flock through your doors, said the Lord. Amen, brothers and sisters. Yeah, give me an amen. Can I hear an amen? Amen. 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 Yeah, hallelujah. Very good. And then he said to me, all that your congregation has to do to pour out these blessings is simply sign over the deeds of their houses to the church. <laughs> and that I will bless them with riches from heaven. They will all become millionaires and all their problems will disappear. So, brothers and sisters, our treasurer, Sister Shelley, will be waiting outside <laughs> with forms for you to sign on your way out. Amen, brothers and sisters. Can I get another amen? Amen. amen? amen! It's a bit frightening, isn't it, to think that there are actually some churches, some church leaders who are like that. Yeah, I can see you nodding there, Blaze. You've, you've experienced it, haven't you? Yeah. They feed on people's misery, often, frankly. They create an image of the world that is so pumped up with future hope. That gullible people really do believe that God is in the business of making them wealthy. But they are tricked into making preachers wealthy instead. Do you remember the story I told last week? Those of you who were here or who watched online about the, the, the apostle that was pointed out to me. His house on the hill in West Africa where he'd built himself a fine mansion from all the donations of his followers. Well, according to today's gospel, modern day prosperity preachers are not the only people to have got it wrong and to have got the wrong end of the stick. Verse 21, from that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. Well, you can just imagine Peter's reaction, can't you? He's, he's just confessed Jesus as the Messiah, as we heard last week. He's just been told by uh, Jesus that on him, Mr. Rocky, uh, the new rock, Jesus was going to build his church. But now Jesus is talking about having to suffer and die. Well, Peter probably thinks Jesus has gone nuts. <laughs> Perhaps the Messiah has been working too hard. Never, Lord, he says, never. This, this shall never happen to you. God forbid it, Lord. But Jesus is adamant. He tells Peter off with a really startling phrase, get behind me, Satan. Pretty stern stuff, isn't it? And then Jesus goes on in verse 23. You are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. In other words, you're thinking like a man, like a human. By now, you should be starting to think as God thinks. Seeing things from God's perspective. And then here comes what, uh, what I gather is called today uh, the drop the mic moment. You know, when you, when you make that statement that no one can possibly refute and you just walk away. Here it is. Jesus says, if anyone is to become my follower, they must deny themselves, 
take up their cross and follow me. So what does it mean to embrace suffering as part of the Christian life? Well, I'd like to introduce you in your minds to my friend Lucy, not her real name. Lucy had spent all her life serving others in the church. She'd been at coffee mornings and fundraisers. She'd served on the PCC. She'd made endless cups of tea. She had truly denied herself for others. And yet Lucy now found herself bedbound. Unable to serve others anymore. She even had to rely on others to take her to the bathroom. Lucy's body was failing her, but not her mind. She said to me, perhaps God is teaching me that there's still a bit of pride in me. I'm learning that I need to let others serve me for a change. Perhaps I'm learning that in the end, we must all rely on God and on other people. That none of us can exist in isolation. I was, I was intensely moved by what Lucy said as she was well into her 90th year. After a lifetime of faith, God was teaching her something deep, something profound about our need for each other. And for God. There was, for Lucy at least, a purpose in her suffering. She learned to gladly take up her cross for what it would teach her and others, even as she neared the end of her life. Now, this of course does not explain all suffering. To even begin to explore the place of suffering in God's plan would take a lot more time than I have today. And it does little to explain the awful and apparently senseless suffering of so many. I, I don't want to gloss over those issues. But I suggest to you that Jesus does offer us a clue. Jesus himself had to suffer and to die. But through death came resurrection. There is hope at the end of all tunnels of suffering for those who trust in God's essential goodness. And for those who are open, like Lucy, to hearing God's voice in the midst of suffering. So, May you come to know the power of God that is often revealed in suffering. May you come to know the power of denying self and taking up the cross that is offered to you. May you come to know that God's power is so often revealed in and through weakness. Our own weakness and the weakness of those we encounter and serve. And it's all right. You don't really have to sign over the deeds of your houses to Sister Shelley on your way out today. Amen.